Can you hear me back there? Yeah. OK, great. Well, Gus, thank you uh, for that introduction. Um, it is so good to be back here. Um, you know, as Gus mentioned, I had spent five years here working um, on the eighth floor of Hatcher Library. I mean, of course, I left the eighth floor, and I went and walked around campus a lot. Um, and now I'm a Tar Heel, but I, I do um, still root for Blue, root for Michigan, um, particularly um, if there's another school involved um, that their colors are dark blue and they're in Durham, North Carolina. Um, so I understand, you know, Michigan, Ohio State, Carolina, Duke, it's, it's really the same kind of animosity that exists. So it's good to be back here. And um, as Gus said, I don't know this is, this is going to be a typical presentation, but I, I wanted to talk with you about, you know, how I became really invested in scientific publishing. And when I was here, of course, this was a topic of discussion. It's always been a topic of discussion in higher ed, and particularly in research libraries. Um, but when I became the university librarian at, at, at Carolina, you know, I was hit with some significant budget constraints that forced me to become really knowledgeable about this issue. And one of those was the inflation of, of journals. And what happened was, years after years of inflation, it literally got to the point where if, if the university was to fund the inflation of the journals at the University of North Carolina, it was over $5 million. So that's a lot of cheddar, right? That's a lot of money. And, and so when I came in, I had to address that and, and see how we could um, be at the research library for the university, support the research enterprise, and also partner with the faculty and, and um, administrators on campus. So I'm going to jump right in. I'll do the click. OK. So I'm just going to say this off the bat, that the system we have is not working. And hopefully, throughout the course of this talk, you will agree with me <laughs> that, this is, that this is, in fact, the case. And there are so many factors. And today, you know, I'm going to go through about 400 years of history and things like that. You know, I won't be able to dig in deeply in any of these topics. I mean, I could spend an hour on peer review. I could spend an hour on journal impact factors. I could spend an hour on open access. And so we'll really scratch that surface, and hopefully uh, you'll feel comfortable falling up. But I definitely want you to um, use the resources you have at your fingertips. I mean, you have. Michigan Libraries is one of the greatest libraries in the world. They have a great scholarly communications office, great librarians there. So a lot of the things I'm talking about, I'll be specifically talking about Carolina, but they certainly apply here. OK, so what is scholarly communications, and how does it relate to scientific publishing? And so this is a, a graph that's used quite often to talk about the publication cycle, which is also another Another word you can use for scholarly communications. And so what you'll hear throughout the course of my talk is when I say scientific publishing and scholarly communications, they're, they're actually, I'm using them synonymously, like they're, the, they're one and the same. But essentially it's that process of a scholar, researcher, creating a product, doing research, collecting data, and then going through this whole cycle process. And there are hundreds of different images that describe this process, um, and this is just one I happen to select. OK. So throughout the course of this talk, the, here are the areas I'm going to cover. And like I said, I'll, I'll be able to scratch the surface. But I think these are all factors that really get to this point of how do we get here and, and what's not working for us. So let's talk about peer review. Now, these dates are debatable, but generally speaking, um, peer review 
has been around for hundreds of years, and it started with the Royal Society. And so some people argue about, you know, was it the Royal Society of London, or Royal Society of Edinburgh? Um, but, um, oh, there's a typo there. Um, <laughs> but the, the Royal Society is the longest running scientific journal in the world. And the, the basic definition I could use is that scholarly communications is um, essentially the process that researchers communicate with each other. It's the process of stewarding research, disseminating research, creating research. And then in that ecosystem, you have publishers, scholars, and libraries that all work together. And so when we go back and we think about peer review, this is a core part of the scholarly communications process. And um, back in the 1600s or, late, or the 17th century, um, you had these societies um, that were all male for, for the for the greater part of, of, of their um, beginnings. And they essentially wanted to create a process to share their research. And so they set up editorial committees. Um, they had the philosophical transactions. And, and so what's really interesting was when you study the history of the Royal Society, there are a lot of problems that existed in the 17th century that persist today. And so I was reading through some of the archives and they're really amazing archives. If, if you want to know about the Royal Society, you need to study Eileen, um, Aileen Fife. Like, she's the historian of the Royal Society, and she's done some amazing work. But um, a lot of her research has talked about, um, as they were, as a society members would gather, the whole point was for society members to look at research for themselves, right? And so, the, only members of the society could actually publish research. And so they didn't start going out of the society until the um, 1800s and 1900s. But essentially, they started with these philosophical transactions, and what, what happened was they became burdened by this process, right? And so this peer review process is, is this a good journal? Is this a good article? Are the methods sound? Is this something that is appropriate for the Royal Society. And so initially, this peer review process essentially was about censorship. You know, it really was about, um, on one hand, um, controlling the garbage that could certainly come out. But on the other hand, it was about controlling who got to talk about research and who got to decide um, whether or not it was good research. And so one thing that's really important to to recognize is the role of technology in this whole process. And so you have, in 1830, you have the transactions that form um, after actually the proceedings were first created. And then in 1880 through 1930, you see this tremendous growth, right? And that's largely because of um, the invention of the typewriter as well as, um, well, that's the, the main thing is the, the, how the typewriter really became um, a key tool for drafting the, the research. And so at the early cases of the uh, or early archives, you see the handwritten articles that are written. And then um, into, in the 1800s, I think it was around 1859, the typewriter was created. And then it wasn't until about 1910 where typewriters were standard. And so they literally they had the same um, typewriters. Each You had a key that was attached to a type bar that had a corresponding letter and that was molded, and that started in about 1910. The other thing you should know is that um, in the 1800s, newspapers are really flourishing. That is a way that people um, learn about the world. That's the first account of what's going on um, in uh, primary research. And so the newspapers are, are already flourishing in um, York, flourishing pretty much throughout the world. And then in 1945, women were admitted to the Royal Society and um, began the process of peer reviewing. And so they were able to read articles, write reviews of the articles, and they were part of the process of, of deciding who got to publish and who didn't. And then it wasn't until um, 1968 that the Royal Society let people outside of the society review papers. And the reason was it was necessity. They were completely bombarded with um, peer review. And there's, in the archives, there's these hilarious stories of scholars, or people in the society basically saying, look, I have reviewed like 15 papers this year. Please release me 
from this servitude, like I can't do this anymore, this is killing me. Um, you know, I don't have a life anymore because I have to read these papers. And so it becomes really cumbersome and at this, in 1968 they have to open it up. And so if we even look now, like I was reading about um, Blaise Cronin, who was the editor of the um, JASIS, the Journal of the American Association of, I think, Information and Science Technology or something like that. But he basically said, in order to publish 400 titles, you need 1,000 peer reviewers. So if you want to publish 400 titles in a year for your journal, you need 1,000 reviewers. However, you need, to, you need to reach out to 3,000 people to get 1,000 peer reviewers. And so these peer reviewers are scholars from all over the world, scholars who are experts in this field. And for every person you invite, you're going to get rejected at least twice. And so you could see I'm painting this picture of a process that is really cumbersome and um, a process that is um, given for free. And so scholars are doing this work because of their service to the profession and their service to the university, but they are not compensated directly for this peer review work. So I'll actually come back to this because um, I'm looking at my time. I'll come back to this about the problems, but some of these things, um, the solutions that I'm, I'll talk about are pretty radical solutions. <laughs> and for those of you who have gone through the peer review process and published your research, you'll see that there, there are some people who think my ideas are really, really crazy. But what I could say generally with this current system that we have um, is that it's a really slow process. And, and Gus, I really appreciate you talking about how it used to be, um, but it's, it's still a slow process. And even with the technology that we have, it still could take six, nine, 12 months to get your articles published. Researchers spend a lot of time rejecting articles. There are some, some um, journals that have rejection rates of 90 to 95%. So you can imagine how much rejection is going on to get to that rejection rate. Um, the metrics that we use to define quality are questionable, and I'll talk more about that. Where you publish becomes more important than what you publish. There's a lot of inequity in the peer review system. When you start to dig in and study that the bulk of peer review in some areas, it could be as high as 80% male doing the peer review, 80%. Uh, if we look at how scholarship is changing globally, China is emerging as a huge producer, yet Chinese peer reviewers are about less than 20% of the peer reviewing happening on, um, going on right now. Editors hold a tremendous amount of power. They're gatekeepers. They decide who gets to come in and, and who, who doesn't. Then there's this confidentiality. There's a process between the editor, the author, um, and the reviewers. And sometimes it's a blind process where people don't know who they're reviewing or they don't, they don't know who's re doing the reviewing. And sometimes it's not. So this is something that's um, been debated quite a bit. And then I think the only visible outcome of this peer review process is the article, and I think that's problematic. Um, the next thing I want to talk about is the journal impact factor. And this is the definition of it, um, but it's, it's generally considered that bibliometric indicator of quality. And so in 1955, uh, Eugene Garfield started thinking about this impact factor. And Eugene Garfield, was a librarian and he started his own business and his job was about indexing. And so publishers and societies paid him to set up indexing so that scholars can find out what articles are being published. And um, Eugene Garfield and another person named Irving um, Schur came up with this system um, because they wanted to um, essentially create a metric to decide what are the most important journals and how can librarians select journals more efficiently. And um, he also wanted to set up a metric because he was specifically interested in science journals. And he knew that um, there must be a way to create a metric so it doesn't matter how, how big your article or how big your journal is, it doesn't matter how big your profession is, 
there must be some way we can boil it down to, a, to one metric. So the um, impact factor really caught on, much to Eugene Garfield's dismay. Um, it became a product, and in 1992, Thomson Reuters acquired that, um, the whole patent and, and began to um, really use this impact factor as a quality measure for research. And, and so we're, what we have now is each journal gets this impact factor. And this number, um, it takes a lot of time for it to change. So, and your goal is you want the highest impact factor you can get for your journal. Okay, let's move on. And so, that was a quick <laughs> review. I could go on and on about impact factors. But I think what's, um, one of the challenges with the impact factors of using this metric is that it's becoming so prominent because researchers don't have the time to read the articles and you don't always have the experts available to do this peer review. And so you need this shortcut and this impact factor has become that shortcut. Um, I also believe that what journals are focusing on is not making their um, articles better and higher quality and focused on innovation and solving problems, it's really about branding and trying to make um, the journal as attractive as possible. I also um, want to point out that high impact journals maintain this position of um, being the best. And what they do is they consi um, consistently accept less and less articles. And so in the world that we have now, there's no paper limits. You should be able to publish a lot more t um, titles and articles than you did before. But because journals are trying to keep their impact factors high, they are rejecting more and more titles, and that's not actually necessary. And then the other thing is um, determining quality and using these metrics is a very, um, it also seems like a gatekeeping function that I think really doesn't focus on equity and it disadvantages certain kinds of journals. Okay, so here's just some rare examples, but there's these phenomena called coercive citation, citation manipulation, citation pushing, and, and these are cases where you submit your article to a publisher, and they say, this is a great article, um, but you know what, you need to cite this journal a little bit more. Like, why don't you come up with five more citations, and then we'll accept your article. <laughs> This happens, this happens actually, it's hard to detect it, but this does happen. Um, and then I think one of the biggest challenges is what we call citation cartels, in which um, groups of authors, um, editors, or journals, um, they basically um, collude to cite each other's work. And it doesn't matter if it really has to do with the topic or anything, they just throw it in there. And, um, and there have been a couple people who have been caught, and, and each major publisher has essentially a department whose job is to watch out for these types of um, basically illegal things that are, that are done. So the second thing I wanted to mention is that, um, so we talked about history of peer review, history of, of journal impact factors. Now we're gonna talk about this whole idea of, a, now we have this commercial publisher who uses the peer review process and who uses journal impact factors. So the system of scientific publishing is essentially an oligopoly, right? And so I'll show you how five publishers are basically controlling the bulk of scientific publishing that's happening in the world today. So the first thing I just want to point out is that text is really small, but the orange is um, Reed Elsevier. So their operating profit margins are 37%. That's a $4 billion company, right? J.P. Morgan Chase is 31.5, Apple's 26.6, Alphabet, that's Google, is 23.6%, and then you go down to Amazon. Their operating profit margins are only 2.3%. So the only companies that tend to make more than Elsevier are pharmaceutical companies. So they're making a lot of money. Like I said, the publishing business is about $8 billion. Elsevier has about half of that. So I mentioned the big five. These are the big five. Um, Elsevier is a $4 billion business. 
Springer Nature's about two billion. Wiley might be about one um, billion. And then Sage and Taylor and Francis are much smaller. Um, their, their operating profits are, I mean, they're very small compared, um, maybe about 45 million or something like that. But this is concentration. And so this is from 2013, and, and I'm working to do, to update this research to look at what it looks like in 2019. But back in 2013, Reed Elsevier is about a quarter of um, all the publishing. And this is in the, all of natural and medical sciences. Then you got Springer at 12%, Wiley Blackwell at 11%. Then you look at the social sciences and humanities. This is actually what concerns me the most, is how these five publishers are um, increasingly getting a bigger piece of this pie. And you'll see Elsevier um, decreases, but you have a higher rate from Wiley, Blackwell, Taylor, and Francis. So this is the Sciences and human Humanities. And then the other part that's happening is that these big publishers are consuming all of the small publishers or the learned societies. And so you might not be able to read those numbers, but the key part is you'll see that immense strike um, or uptick in 1997 and then 2001 where you see that um, the, the big publishers are eating up the small publishers and that's like the red that you see. And so the red is, is, is the biggest um, push percentage that you see here and it's really going from, um, you know, it's a big publisher and they're going to sell it to a small publisher, it's, it's the other way around. But this really concerns me. Um, and so this concentration has a severe impact on higher education, and in particular, the research libraries. And so this is an example from my institution. So in 2009, um, the big five comprised of about 22% of my budget. Now, this year, it's 58%. And I haven't looked at other institutions, but I would guess that Michigan and UCLA and the others are, are roughly around the same. And so now this brings me to the cereals crisis, um, which has actually been in effect for, I don't know, it's been about 30 years we've been talking about this cereals crisis. But essentially, the cost of journals has um, risen so high and it has made it very difficult for research libraries and higher ed to keep up and to purchase this research. And so I just want to call out that the um, consumer price index increased 73% from 86 to 2004, yet research library expenditures for cereals increased 273%. So a big part of this is once the internet came about and journals were becoming electronic, the big publishers started bundling. And so what they would do is, instead of you selecting each journal you wanted to purchase, they would wrap them up. And so you'd get about 1,600, 2,000, 3,000 titles. And we called that the big deal. And libraries loved it because you didn't have to spend all that time selecting all the journals you wanted to purchase. They would just wrap them all up and sell them to you. And what happened was it sounded like a good deal, but now it's completely engulfed a lot of our budgets for journals. And so here's another um, example of the inflation. And uh, I just wanted to use this because people don't realize that books inflate, journals inflate, data inflate. This is what's going on. Um, and this is a consistent, I'll be looking at some data from 2014 to now. And it, it, the curve it just keeps going the same direction. So I wanted to show you just with, again, Carolina, and this is my um, health uh, library, my health sciences library. And so in 2008, 2009, um, journal subscriptions were 70% um, of the budget. And now in 17, 18, it's 94%. And this is just my um, health sciences library. But if I look at just Elsevier, Elsevier, um, used to be 18% of my budget, and now it's 33% of my budget, and that's one publisher. Again, I think a lot of other institutions are the same. And this is just a, a looking at the budget that I have, which is um, 
roughly around between 16 and 18 million dollars I spend on journals and books and um, and you'll see how the state funding has decreased and I'm using more of my endowments um, money from grants to pay for the collections that we have because the costs are going up so high and I, I actually have a flat budget so we know about the cereals crisis, and we know the, the strain that it's putting on library budgets and, and higher ed. Um, but I think the other part that makes this such an egregious situation is the fact that a lot of, that most of the intellectual property that scholars produce is not owned by the scholar. So you have to own your research. And, um, and so just to demonstrate, so if you look at the bottom, um, right here, you look at, okay, who's doing the research, the data collection and analysis? And you go up, it's the researcher, right? And the universe, or the funder's paying for it. So NSF, National Science Foundation, and National Institutes of Health. So then you go to the next phase, who's actually, you know, now you have to write the article. Well, it's the researcher that's writing the article, and it's a university, or in, in our case, it's the citizens of the state of Michigan and North Carolina who are paying the university, or paying for the university, which pays the scholars to do the research, to write the article. Then you get to the point where the peer review that we talked about, the peer review is done by the researcher and paid by the university and the taxpayers. Then you get to the publication phase. That's when the publishers start to add their value. And so the publishers do their work and the typesetting and things, and then, um, and this is the thing that they charge us for. And then it comes at the very end, who pays for the discovery and dissemination? It's libraries. So just to put it in another way, the scholar creates the research, the content, and gives it to the publishers for free. The scholars peer review it for free. And then the publishers package it up and sell it to the libraries, right? <laughs> so, that's what I call a racket, right? That's, that's a, you. So the other part is, is this, the reason why this is so hard is that the, the university and the scholars don't own anything. The publishers own the content. And so what happens is um, when you get your article accepted, the first thing they do is, um, you know, it's just, you're just, so grateful that your article was accepted, but they send you a, a contract or a license that it's basically asks you to, re, to um, give up your rights. And on my campus, and I know this is the same case here, the library is really trying to build awareness and say, as a scholar, you do not have to give up your rights. You can actually retain your copyright. So when you publish an article in a peer-reviewed journal, you own the full copyrights to the article. And authors own the copyright to their works until they sign the copyright over to the publisher. And that's the key part that people don't know. You own it, and then you give it back to the, you give it to the publisher. And I think a lot of scholars don't understand that they're doing this. And they're giving exclusive rights to the publisher to reprint to, tr um, to translate, to do it in digital, to do whatever they want with the article. And I think the challenge is, without the rights, the scholars and authors may not be able to dis distribute copies of their own papers in their own classes. Now, fortunately, we have a rule or a law called you know, fair use, which allows scholars to, to use research and, and for teaching and, and research and learning. But essentially, the fact that authors give up their rights, it makes it more difficult and more time consuming for them to just post the article on their own webpage or to deposit in a repository. Okay, so now, in light of all these challenges that I've laid out, you know, libraries are really, have always been um, thinking about how do we have a more sustainable scientific publishing um, ecosystem? And let's talk about open access. So um, how many of you have heard of what's going on at the University of California with the fact that that, okay, some of you have heard that um, University of California did the unthinkable 
in, I believe it was um, February, they decided to cancel their subscription with the world's largest publisher of scientific research, Elsevier. They had a 50 million deal, and that's 10 universities make up the University of California system. They have a 50 million deal, and they walked away. And so no one ever thought this would ever happen. But this is one of those cases where we're reaching this tipping point and something has to be done. So this caught a lot of attention. And so what we've been trying to do is, at Carolina, think about what's important to us. And so for me, it's always about this research is basically funded by the taxpayers. It should be affordable and it should be accessible to taxpayers. So we have these four values that are unnegotiable and, and this is how we decide what we license and what we don't, what cereals we're gonna buy, which publishers we're gonna work with. And so we were on this campaign and we're setting up town halls, we're, um, we're doing everything that we can to communicate with the campus, communicate with anybody actually, um, students, graduate students, um, donors, faculty, staff, to let them know that we don't have a sustainable ecosystem in place right now. And if you're a scholar and you're doing this research and your library is never ever going to be able to afford to buy it, that's a problem. And so this is something we've been working on. And so I want to talk to you about open access. This is something that has been around, I would say, for a good um, couple decades. And what I could say is um, in 2002, there was a meeting and in Budapest, and it was called the Budapest Open Access Initiative. And they issued a public statement of principles related to open access to research literature. And, and so they had this meeting and it really got people thinking about why research should be public. Research, or why do we do research? We do research to create new knowledge. We do research to alleviate human suffering. We do research to understand humanity. These are things that should not be locked behind paywalls. They should be open to everybody. And so after the Budapest Initiative, uh, basically a year later, we had the Berlin Declaration of Open Access to Knowledge in the, social, in the Sciences and Humanities. And that again is a, a, an international statement of open access and access to knowledge. And it emerged from a conference um, in Berlin um, that was hosted by the Max Planck Society. Then, after that, in, 2000, in the same year, 2003, there was a Bethesda statement on open access publishing. And that was basically shepherded by the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. And they got together and said that we have to start setting up open access journals. Knowledge should not be locked away. So you had the three Bs, you had Budapest, Berlin, and Bethesda. And that's pretty much what launched the open access movement. So what is open access? And it's an intentional choice to make your work available, accessible, and available without barrier to the world. So it really is, and we make it clear that it's intentional choice that you have to decide that this is what you want to do. Now we do know that, like why would you make your article open to the world? And there's so much research that demonstrates that it becomes more um, downloaded, cited more, accessible more, um, if you make it open. And if you want to be part of a more inclusive and collaborative scholarly community, open access is important. If you don't if you're not affiliated with an elite institution, like a Michigan, like a Carolina, like a Berkeley, you really don't have access to a lot of this research. And that doesn't seem fair. So here's some information about open access and how it actually has been growing. Um, and this is really great news that it's growing. The challenge is the journals that are not open access, that, that are locked behind paywalls, are growing faster <laughs> than open access journals. So, um, so on one hand, it's great news that, that people are more likely to publish in open access than they were in the past. 
but also people are more likely to publish in paywall journals as well. So we have to keep working on this. So one of the things that a lot of institutions have done is um, they have set up what we call institutional repository. And so here it's called Deep Blue. Um, at my institution, it's called the CDR, which is the Carolina Digital Repository. But essentially, it's a place for faculty and scholars or anyone at the institution to deposit their work. And so you get a, a digital object identifier. It's freely available. It's easy to deposit. It's accessible, searchable. And even if you need an embargo, um, if you can't release your paper until a couple months or, or you're under some sort of agreement, most of these institutional repositories can do it. And every, pretty much every research institution has an institutional repository. So one thing I wanted to mention is a term called leakage. So now that I'm, I'm painting this picture and setting the table for you to, to see the components of scholarly publishing, um, I want to mention that um, there are um, sites out there that also distribute scholarly research. And some of them are certainly illicit, while others are legal. And so, for example, I mentioned the, the Carolina Digital Repository. That's a legal site that is authorized, that an author can deposit their article in Deep Blue or the Carolina Digital Repository. But then there are also um, other sites. <laughs> and um, I want to be clear that no library would ever um, condone or encourage the use of illegal sites. And so what we have now is a huge um, amount of effort to pirate scholarly research and put it in a place and people come to these sites and they get the, the research that they need. And this is a growing problem. I mean, this is Elsevier and Springer, they're, they're losing millions and millions of dollars as a result of this pirated information. And it's just growing. And so this is a major leakage that's happening. And another area that they consider leakage is like the Social Science Research Network, ResearchGate, Academia EDU. These are places where, um, or traditionally, publishers expect users to go to their website via the library to access content. And so they know who's coming to their website. Leakage is an example of they're, they're bypassing the, the publisher's website and going to Sci-Hub or ResearchGate or Academia.edu. So going back to the title of my talk, how can it be wrong to publish in the right journals? And I think it's a really, it's a, it's a complicated question. And I, of course, it's not wrong to do so in that scholars and faculty need to publish. They need to get tenure. They need to get promoted. But I just wanted to throw some really quick ideas about some ways that we could change this process. The first, and, and there are some examples that are already in place right now. But if you're going to spend all, uh, hours, and I've peer reviewed lots of, of, um, of articles, and I spent hours. You know, sometimes it's like two hours, four hours. It's a lot of time. There must be a better way to get credit for that service. I also think that um, is there a way that the interaction between the author and the peer reviewer could be more transparent? And I know for some people it's like, would, would you be honest if, you, if, if your name was <laughs> disclosed as a reviewer? And I know that could be a really touchy issue, but I think there's some room, there's some wiggle room there to be more transparent. The other thing, which I think is, is, can be pretty radical, is that maybe peer review should be journal agnostic. Maybe we could find ways to judge the quality without tying it specifically to the journal. Fourth part, part is maybe it should be a more consultative process. And maybe, as Gus had mentioned, and as the Physics Archive is a perfect example, there's a lot of examples where an author can, will put their research out there, and then people will immediately start reading it and dissecting it and, and, and looking at it and commenting on it. Maybe that's the, a better process as crowdsourcing. It's a more consultative process 
that could evolve. The other thing that I think is, is troublesome is the power of the editor and how much they control the process. And I think that maybe if it, if it were shifted to the author to decide when articles are ready to be published, that might balance the um, inequities. And then the other part is just the dissemination of the research. How do we put the power back in the hands of the author? Um, because it seems to me that the author who's producing this research is at a significant disadvantage. And again, I, I can't go into all these details, but here's just some quick ideas about the peer review process. Now for journal impact factors, this is that metric that we assign. Oh wow, there's a mistake here. That's the same one. Ah, sorry about that. I didn't, um, something happened here. But what I could say is the, for the journal impact factor, I believe that um, there could be a way of starting all over and, and going against this whole journal impact. And so, for example, Elsevier has even come up with its own metric that they think is a better metric for, for measuring quality than the journal impact factor. I think the other thing that we could be doing with the journal impact factor is um, couple, or actually, I'm sorry, is to use a metric that is really focused on the article and not the journal. And so what's happened is, like, like I said earlier, it's not what you publish, it's where you publish. And what we want to do is flip it. So what's most important is what you publish. That's most important, not where you publish. So you flip that. And so what I'm suggesting is that we need significant reform in five areas. One is research assessment, and that goes, that, that goes hand in hand with impact factors. The second is researchers should keep the copyright. They should not be allowed to give it away. Right? Now, I have to say there's some examples where it makes sense for, for a, a scholar to not retain copyright, and we could talk about the Q&A. Certainly good examples with patents and other things. Um, peer review definitely needs to be reformed. It's an inequitable process. Um, the research infrastructure also needs to be reformed. The technology is there to change it. And I didn't go into a lot of details, but um, publishers like Elsevier, over the past 20 years, they, they have, he, Elsevier has bought over 100 companies. And so what they're doing is they're trying to control the entire infrastructure of research. And then finally, this is kind of the elephant in the room is promotion and tenure. That's, um, that's major. <laughs> Publish or perish, right? That is something that's not going to go away anytime soon. And that's going to require a great deal of work from universities to um, change this process. And right now, I'm working with the Promotion and Tenure Task Force at the University of North Carolina. And we're at the point now where we're trying to think, well, what can um, the university do to uh, be more inclusive and to think about publish and perish in different ways? And I think some of the examples that we're talking about is how do we reward scholars for teamwork? How do we reward scholars for publishing in open access journals, which are peer-reviewed, high-quality journals? Can departments get together annually and look at the scope of journals that are out there? Because what we don't want to happen is a junior scholar to be punished for, for publishing in an open access journal. That's not what you want to do. And so this promotion and tenure process is very entrenched. How do we figure out a way for it to be more flexible and to think about the types of, of work that count. And so this is indelibly linked with publish and perish. And so we really have to figure out how do we get the system working in a better way. All right. And I'm going to end on that. I have a, a reading list here that um, I assume will be shared. There are so many other articles that are relevant in this um, talk. But um, I'm going to stop here and open up the floor for questions.